annual budget hearing, 7 p.m. on October 24th. This meeting has been noticed in the district, and notices have also been sent to the Ozaki News Graphic and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Ben for the presentation of our 1819 budget. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, the presentation tonight will mostly go over some of the highlights of the budget, uh, since there's obviously a lot of detail that goes into the fiscal year each year. Uh, more detail on the budget can be found in the packet um, that's in the front there. Um, goes into more details in terms of actual line items, uh, more explanation of some of the detail, um, some of the finance and whatnot. Um, so this presentation will mostly focus on some of the highlights from that, from that packet. Uh, starting off, just looking at 1718 in review. Uh, last year for our fiscal year, we used just over 850000 out of our fund balance to fund uh, multiple <coughs> planned projects for the district. Those include the water light system at West Lawn, um, some of the final expenses for the tennis courts and the LED light replacements that we had, and then the digital signage that we put up this, um, this summer. Uh, that leaves our ending fund balance just above $7.6 million uh, at the end of 1718. Uh, which is a 23.27% um, general fund fund balance. Um, board recommended policy is 15%, so we're well above that, uh, but that amount still isn't high enough to avoid, have us avoid short-term borrowing, so we can still do that. Um, projected fund balance at the end of 1819 is projected to be at that same amount because we are projecting a balanced budget for the general fund, and I'll get more detail as we go along with that. Um, if you have any questions as I go through this presentation, feel free to ask them or speak up. Uh, there's also notes in the presentation for what page in the packet uh, this information can be found on. Uh, this is a large packet, so um, noting those. Uh, just an overview of the 1819 budget. Like I said, it's a balanced one uh, for this year. Some of the main highlights include a 3.8% increase in revenues. That's mainly from uh, increase in enrollment that has increased our revenue limit for this year. Uh, the other big increase was, the, was from per pupil aid that got a bump of $204 uh, dollars per student this year. This is the second half of the biennial budget, uh, so where that number will go in 1920 and beyond is still unknown. Um, but as of right now, we know that number will be increasing for this fiscal year. In terms of expenditures, we're looking at a 1.1% increase in expenditures in the general fund. Uh, that's mainly due to inflationary increases, uh, a larger transfer amount into Fund 46, and then the restructuring of our other post-employment benefits that we did this, this year to reduce our future liability uh, down the road. For the tax levy rate, that continues to decline. Uh, since 2013, that has been unsteadily, steadily decreasing from year to year. Uh, the total all fund levy for this year being proposed is $22,387,800. Uh, that would bring the average mill rate to $9.01. Uh, last year the average mill rate was $9.10, so a decrease of $0.09 cents from last year, or a 1% decrease. For the average homeowner in the community, which is valued at $276,000, this would save approximately $25 per year. Um, so a slight decrease, but still a decrease from what we're looking at last year. Uh, and like I said before, a trend that's been continued since 2013. One of the major factors that uh, plays into the mill rate are property values. Uh, since 2013, those have been increasing pretty steadily. Uh, this year we saw an increase of 3.7%, so that brings our total uh, property values for the district just under $2.47 billion. Uh, as these continue to increase, like I said, this helps build a larger tax base that helps with the, the levy rate uh, that we see in the community. These property values come to us in October from the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. Uh, it's one of the last factors that we are waiting for as we prepare the budget for this year. That and equalize uh, aid from the state. Uh, and it was one of the main reasons why we have this presentation towards the, the later part of uh, October. This slide just breaks uh, breaks down property values by municipality. Uh, we, uh, we have six municipalities that make up our district boundaries, with the city and town of Cedarburg making up 90% of that. Um, so that's our largest tax base. Uh, but we do have portions of the city of Mequon, the town of Grafton, village of Grafton, and the town of Jackson um, that make up um, part of that as well. Uh, so when we set the tax levy, 
The next step of that process is to certify it and then send it out to these municipalities and then distribute it among their tax base um, for the fiscal year. District membership, when we look at that, like I said, it's increasing for this year. Uh, we saw an increase of 33 resident students um, for this uh, September. Uh, we do two counts each year, September and January, uh, with the September count being the, the one that factors into our revenue limit. Uh, both the September and the January count factor into our uh, equalization aid numbers for the next year. Um, so we'll do that in January when that comes up. Uh, like I said, we did see, see an increase of 33 resident students this year. Um, that increased our membership by 33. Uh, the way the revenue limit membership is calculated is based on a three-year average against the three years prior to that, that average. Uh, so as a result of that increase, that number is increased, leading to revenue limit um, going up. We factor in uh, summer school participation as well, because that factors into our membership. Uh, we saw an increase in those numbers um, in addition, uh, which led to a total FTE increase of 35 for this year, um, which is one of the main reasons why our revenue increased for uh, the fiscal year. When we look at our enrollment or our headcounts, uh, number of students that we have in our buildings, uh, that increased by 28 students. And the main reason those two numbers are different is that our open enrollment numbers decreased this year. Uh, open enrollment in students decreased by four students, and open enrollment out decreased by one. Right now. One of the other major highlights from this year's budget is our long-term capital improvement trust fund. Um, in the spring of 2017, we started that fund with an initial positive of just $100 just to get it going. Part of this trust fund is that it has a five-year timetable in terms of when you make a deposit, you have to wait five years before you can pull money out. Um, so we wanted to get that going. Uh, but last year, the board made a commitment of 300000 into that trust fund uh, to help build that. And then this year, we are proposing uh, in the budget, increasing that amount by 200000 to bring it to 500000 um, for this year. Uh, with that deposit, the total amount in that fund would come, up, um, come to be just over 800000 800, by the end of this year. Uh, that extra uh, 6000 makes up basically interest costs that we earn uh, while that trust fund is the money sitting there. The benefit of this trust fund is that we can use it um, down the line in 2022 when that timetable runs up. The benefit is that when we use it, uh, it doesn't go against our shared costs. And shared costs is an important number because that factors into our equalization aid. The way the formula works for Seabrook School District, the more uh, we have in shared costs, the less we get in state aid. So down the line, if we have a larger project that ends up being a million, million and a half, we can have that expense and not have to worry about losing state aid in the part of the the next year as a result. Last few slides, let's break down the general fund in a little bit more detail, uh, breaking down based on different categories um, that are in line with uh, the Wisconsin standards for how we kind of account for finances. Uh, the first one just looks at revenue uh, in the general fund. Uh, most of our revenue comes from local sources followed by state sources. Uh, we are a district that gets uh, roughly about two-thirds or about 60 percent of our revenue from the local property tax levy uh, with the other third uh, roughly um, from state aid. Uh, in other districts you may see that flipped. Uh, you may see two-thirds from uh, state aid and less from um, tax levy. It's really based on the equalized uh, formula that comes from the state and where property values uh, fall most of the time. The other um, sources of revenue uh, can be from federal grants that we see, uh, so those are the federal sources, uh, and then other miscellaneous uh, revenues we see in terms of um, student fees uh, and or open enrollment revenue we come in uh, that comes in assistance from that program. Breaking down expenses, uh, it has a similar structure in terms of there's two large pieces of the pie. Uh, those being salaries and employee benefits. They make up together about two-thirds of our uh, budget each year. Um, the other large sections or portions of the expenditures that we see um, are in transfers. Um, so transfers will mean the Fund 46 deposit. That also mean the transfer or deposit we have, or, uh, transfer we have for the special education fund. Um, so it's the portion that we have to cover uh, that's not, not covered by the special education fund from uh, 
paid from the state. Uh, and then the other ones are basically other expenses that we have that either are for vendor services, under purchase services, or actual equipment or supplies that we see in the district from um, different purchases and departments. So just to recap um, of the budget, like I said, just highlighting some of the main points for this year's budget. There's a lot more detail in the packet uh, if you want to dive into it a little bit more or if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but some of the main highlights uh, from this year is the balanced budget in the general fund, uh, a decrease of the tax levy for this year of nine cents, or roughly about 1%, and then resident enrollment increase of about 33 students for this year, uh, which is obviously a major factor when we look at finances uh, for a school district. Right. Something timer. Yeah. Uh, like I said, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact me, um, but I can also answer any questions right now. Um, if anything came up as we went through the presentation. Can you just go through a little of the timeline? I mean, to, from what it took you to get to this spot, just because yep. a lot of what we're talking about happens in, in PNF, and I, I want to make sure that everyone knows the process, that they're just doing it on the, on the channel. Yep. Um, so on page seven in the packet, there's a budget planning calendar that really begins right after we end this. So once we have this budget here in presentation, we begin looking at 1920. Uh, and for 1920, it's really planning that out, um, starting to look at different departments um, and getting those budget numbers back um, and building uh, budgets as well. Working on forecasting for 1920 and beyond, um, just like we did for this year for 1819 and beyond. Um, and then working through all those pieces through PNF, through different administrative groups, uh, through the buildings and departments to help build that budget to get us to the point we are now, at right now. Really the last points or the last factors that we uh, have as we complete the budget are the ones that come in October with uh, equalization aid and property values. Um, so we can finish that and set our levy. Uh, Maybe another piece, Ben, would be, you mentioned this is the second of the biannual budget. And that comes from the state. And this, this term is always an easier one of the two to handle, is that correct? Uh, from what we've seen in the past is that, yes, it's a biennial budget, so two-year budget, so really we want to know what that looks like beforehand. And whenever that comes out, then we can kind of set our budget for the next two years. It really helps us. Um, this year, the second year of that helps us because we already, we've already known this number for the last year and a half about. Um, the first year is always a little more difficult depending on when that biennial budget gets adopted. Um, if it's going into September and October, uh, it starts to um, put a little more weight on what we're doing here because we still need to factor in what our budget is going to be uh, and try to settle on that. Uh, we kind of ran into that last year where we had a different, couple different scenarios we worked through, uh, whereas this year we knew that number and we're able to move forward. And, and your thought process for this budget, when you and I met, you're already looking out in the next year in addition, correct? Right. You're always looking at forecast that people need to know, you know, that you're looking out more than just one year that you're looking at your budget process. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the main factor, or the main reason because for that is that um, things we do this year play into how our state aid numbers are figured into next year, where our levy could be set up next year. It's all part of that formula that factors in our actual expenses and revenues uh, for shared costs and kind of how what, what could happen in the future. So. There's definitely a lot of forecasting that goes in with that to make sure that um, we set ourselves up obviously good for this year, but also in a good position next year and beyond um, uh, to some, avoid any of those pitfalls that can come up. Um, can you go over the mill rate and what this budget will have impact wise on the mill rate a little bit more year over year? Yep. Um, so this slide goes over the mill rate, and the mill rate is basically a calculation that tries to get at the average uh, amounts of what a homeowner can expect to own. Uh, it's an average, uh, so it can vary from home to home, uh, but it's really based on two factors, the total levy and what property values are set at. Um, and so using those two, someone could take the, the mill rate, uh, the $9.01 uh, $9 there, and start to kind of estimate what their tax bill may look like from the, the school district. Um, come this winter. So nine dollars and one cent, that's roughly about for every thousand dollars of home value. Um, and like I said, it can vary from home to home based on kind of where uh, their actual assessed value ends up being. 
So it's just a rough gauge to help people take a look at that and kind of plan for the future. How little can you go? But I, I think that's fantastic that it's at 901. You know, we have that downward trend there. So congratulations. Yeah, and there's different things that play into that. And there's obviously for a school district, we work within revenue caps too. So some of that's structured in terms of what we can and can't do. Um, but the board has taken action over the last couple of years to do what they can to decrease it from year to year um, where they can. So Ben, I have a few questions. We posted this for 30 minutes, so you're going to be standing there for the next 15 minutes to answer questions. <laughs> no, just, a, just a couple of questions and then a few comments. So um, enrollment is up 33. And did I hear you correct? The three-year average is, is an increase as well? Yep. Uh, so those would be the two or, or the two green numbers on the far right. Yep. Um, so the most recent one is 2016, 17, and 18. That's our current three-year average, based on our its prior year three-year average, which is 15, 16, and 17. Um, so you can see those two numbers going up on the right there, and that's a factor that plays into what our revenue lap limit will be determined on. It's based on the maximum revenue you can receive per member. <laughs> Oops. And then increase by that number um, the difference between those two. So, so that's why membership is so important when it comes to budgeting and financing for school districts because not only does it play into the revenue limit, but then also it plays into state aid numbers as well. Um, the one kind of quirk about state aid and membership is that membership or state aid lags one year behind. And so the state aid we received this year is based on the membership we counted for last year. Um, so those numbers would be factored into 1920 state aid. Um, so as a result of this increase, we would expect that number to go up. And that increase of 33 is the highest we've done throughout this in how many years? Uh, 15 years. And when I was looking at the, the mill rate, so we're down nine cents, and it, if I looked at the numbers correctly, we're down a dollar twelve since 2013. Right. Uh, and 1%, which is, which is great news. Um, I heard something about an increase in summer school. That, that, that's positive, right? Participation in summer school, right? Yeah, so summer school is counted a little bit differently. It's not number of students, per se, in terms of how many enroll. So when you look at that number, uh, whenever it comes back up there, um, it said 45, and then it was parade to 18. That doesn't mean we only have 45 students in summer school. It's actually based on a uh, number of minutes and hours of participation in summer school. So it's a Big calculation um, that Conrad and his team do to work on what that equates to FTEs. It's just my computer FTEs, shut down. Uh, and then the revenue limit takes 40% of that to bring it to 18. So good news as well. And then the last comment on the open enrollment uh, in has, has, has decreased. Right. Remember, right. So the number's gone down. So less students are coming in. And we've chosen to, to take on less open enrollment students, primarily because our, our, our resident enrollment is is increasing. And if I heard you correctly, OER has decreased as well, meaning less students are, are going out of the system. Uh, yeah, so open enrollment in, uh, we have we have a waiting list for students that want to attend Cedar Bird for the obvious reasons. Um, but, so we have to go through that process in terms of where do we actually have space and where we can put students. Uh, and so it's a long process in terms of can we put students here or can't we? Uh, is this one, this class below the guidelines and we get a bit more one or two students? All part of that goes into determining where we land with open enrollment. Um, and as part of that process, it decreased this year. Open enrollment out, um, that could mean a lot of different things. Uh, open enrollment out could be um, just a student who was open enrollment out, um, who decided to stay in the system. Uh, could be a student who was open enrollment out to move out of the system, so uh, we don't have specifics of where or where, where they went. Uh, it could be just someone who graduated. So. And the same thing's true with open enrollment in. Somebody could move in. The right. restaurant could have supported. Yeah, yeah, we see quite a bit of that um, of students that are sign up to open enroll in, or they have a tuition waiver, and then because they're planning to move into the district eventually. So that those comments that I made are that's all good news, and, and finally to balance the budget, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So Ben, how does the, the membership number change um, compared to actual enrollment? Uh, actual enrollment is basically number of students that we have in the building. 
in the attendance. And so this is the headcount based on that. Right. Membership's a little bit different because what we do with that is we start with that headcount and then we subtract open enrollment in students. We add open enrollment out students um, to really get a number of students who live in the district. So it's really a resident student count. The only factor that plays into that is, are, is that um, students who don't attend all, like full day, like 4K, are prorated too. So they're only counted as 0.6 FTEs. Um, so that's part of the equation too. But maybe it isn't a budget question, but um, are our enrollment numbers going up too? And and um, how are we doing as far as you know, basic, as far as capturing as many as big a percentage of our um, resident um, members um, as as possible? How is that, is that trending upward, downward? How's that going? Um, yeah, well, resident enrollment membership that's going up. Uh, that increased this year uh, by 33. In terms of capturing students who uh, live here and making sure they come to Cedar River School District, that's really the number of students we have open rolling out. And so that's decreased over the last couple of years. Decreased this year by one, but the year before that it decreased by almost 20. Uh, so we see that number going down. It's less than 2% of our resident population. Um, so that's a good number. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into open rolling out too. It's not just a student who just doesn't want to attend here. It could be someone who um, was attending another district, 11th or 12th grade, they move into the system and they want this want to finish in that district because they're almost at the end. So uh, compared to other districts, being below 2% is a pretty good number to be at. Um, being at other districts where that number is a lot higher, uh, it's a lot of dif different conversation when you come to the budget because you're having to basically cover that cost because every student we have going out is just over 7,000 we have to pay to that other district. Uh, so having to cover that expense with within your own budget um, becomes a very hard task. So we're very fortunate to have that. Um, the opposite direction, so. Dave brings up a great point that about three years ago, that was our push as a board, was to try to find a way to capture more resident students or members to stay here rather than going out. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling us that what Dave asked is that we're actually doing that, that's exactly what we set up on three, four years ago. 4K is also a great way to do you sure, get the kids yeah. in the system early, there's a greater likelihood that they It's hard to say if that's any different. Yep. Anyone else? Thank you, Ben, for taking us Thank to you. this point. And Ben has been locked in his office, shades pulled, and uh, <laughs> everything's getting thrown around and broken in there. And we're excited that uh, this part is getting class so we can. Uh, Thank you. Lift up the shades and open his door and continue on with what? Next year. Next year. Yeah. <laughs>